Now, beloved brethren, we've been uh, considering the great message series, Our Great Salvation, and um, we've dealt with the question of foreknowledge of God, we've dealt with the question of predestination, we've dealt with the question of calling, and we began to deal with the question of justification. Uh, for the text of Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to verse 30, tells us that those that God foreknew, those God also predestined. And those that God predestined, God also called. And those that he called, God justifies them. Now, if you remember, um, in the first two messages then, uh, really the, the last two messages dealing with calling, we said God calls sinners. And we were making the point then in our last conversation together that even as God calls the sinners, they stand before him in need of justification. They stand before him vile, wretched, dirty, and unclean. This is absolutely important. Yes, Chris, you may have missed uh, several, <laughs> a week actually, because we had several messages on calling. Uh, and I think you attended some of those. Actually, you're with us here. So I, I, I'm not sure, but we'll sort that out, my brother. Don't worry about it. We have those messages recorded, and I think they have been uploaded on YouTube. So you don't need to worry. If you didn't catch up with anything, uh, you'll be fine, my dear brother. Thank you for me letting me know. Appreciate it. But last time that we were together, then we were examining text, uh, that text in Luke chapter 18, and, 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 and trying to define justification from a biblical exposition standpoint. That is to say, we were looking at that story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And then and what basis then, on what basis that God, does God justify people and who does God justify and how then does God justify? And so we talked about that and we examined it, but we kind of... Um, Leaving the shallow ends of this doctrine, if you may permit me to use this analogy, to use this illustration, we are leaving the shallow ends of this conversation on justification and gradually we are going deeper and deeper into more substantial, if you like, more detailed, more protracted kind of conversations around this subject of justification. And so today we are concerned with really the centrality of the doctrine of justification. Now, another way of uh, referring to centrality is to talk about the importance, the overriding importance, the overarching importance of this doctrine of justification. This idea that God unprompted, unprovoked, unsolicited by anything outside of himself deigns or condescends to declare guilty people not guilty. That out of his own gracious will, out of his gratuitous intervention, God looks at a confirmed criminal and God declares that criminal innocent, absolutely innocent. It is amazing. And somebody referred to it as the scandal of justification. We'll talk about this when we deal with the subject, the dilemma of justification. That's one of the things that we're going to be dealing with in this series on justification, the dilemma of justification. So you better be waiting for that one. And be looking at the Roman Catholic view and the charismatic Pentecostal view and, and all these kind of things. And then why people are so offended most often when we deal with the question of justification, particularly the scandalous idea, this very outlandish, if you like, idea that God gratuitously, freely, unsolicited and unprompted declares confirmed guilty people that they are not guilty. How can that be? In the language of Romans chapter 4, God declares the ungodly 
to be justified. And the Greek words in Romans chapter 4 there for ungodly is God declares criminals innocent, totally innocent, just as if they have never committed a single sin in their lives. But again, one of the messages we'll talk about is what I'm calling the matrix of justification. The matrix of justification. But these are messages that are ahead of us by the will and by the grace of God. The centrality of justification, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the centrality of justification. How important is this matter? Let me go right off the stable with a declaration, with an announcement that upon this doctrine rests all other doctrines of the Christian faith. It is a foundational doctrine upon which all other doctrines make sense. What am I saying here? Martin Luther, the German reformer of the 16th century, the early part of the 16th century, struggled with how he might be right with God. And I'll be dealing with this in the coming messages shortly, or rather casually, uh, perusing over them. But when he came to the light of the children of God, when God opened his eyes to see justification by faith in all its glory, in all its splendor, in all its manifold colors, in all its comfort. Martin Luther declared that he felt as if he was altogether born again. He was altogether born again. And as it were, the gates of heaven were flung open and he walked as it were upon empty doors. That's a testimony of Martin Luther. But he said something else above that one. Martin Luther declared that when he understood the doctrine of justification by faith, which is also to say justification by Christ, Martin Luther says that the whole of Scripture yielded itself to him. Now, that's a strange thing to declare from the German reformer. He says that when he understood the doctrine of justification by faith, the whole treasure of scripture seemed to open up in front of him. Seemed to open up in front of him. Every text seemed to make sense. Now the preacher we're speaking to you right now, myself, when I was confronted with the doctrines of grace, when the claims of the gospel were coming to me in torrents of ever searching and probing intensity. And the message was justification by faith through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That was the message. I struggled with it for the initial three weeks and then another month and a following month and a third month. And ladies and gentlemen, when I understood the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which is justification by Christ alone, apart from works, when I went back to study my Bible in order to confront this new teaching that I'd been exposed to, every text I read had a different feel, had a different flavor. The interpretation was altogether different. I never saw them with the same eyes. It is like the doctrine of justification by faith gave me clearer lenses through which I could look at the text of Holy Scripture. So why am I saying justification by faith is central? Not just to the Christian life, but to the gospel scheme. And yes, to the understanding of the whole scriptural treasure is that history bears witness that justification by faith as a doctrine is a key. Just understanding it yields the rest of scripture. Scripture opens itself up to you. It is vitally, vitally important. So now, 
I'm going to say a second thing then with regard to that whole question of the centrality of the doctrine of justification. Now, I say this a second point. In Scripture, there are those texts, texts of Scripture, which some clever wits in the olden days referred to as mountains of Scripture. These are the high points of Scripture. I mean, that is with regard to texts of Scripture. And then there are some doctrines. There are some teachings that are similarly to be viewed as mountains of Scripture. That is to say, they are the pegs with which scriptural information is hung on a coherent line. I'm going to repeat that. Those pivotal central doctrines are the pegs, pegs with which scriptural information, scriptural data are hung up in a coherent line. Now, doctrine of justification by faith alone is one of those doctrines that are absolutely important. The rest of scripture seems to hang together when this doctrine comes into view. Now, the Bible time and again has revealed itself to us in a manner that helps us to understand that this doctrine of justification by faith sits at the very center of biblical information. Now I refer you way back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Now examining biblical data. Because one of the things that we're going to be struggling with and one of the messages that still lie ahead of us is justification and sanctification. All right? Justification versus works. We've got that message to preach in the coming days. But one of the contentions has been this artificial dichotomy, artificial distinction, artificial separation between the way of salvation in the Old Testament and the way of salvation in the New Testament. Many people have stumbled upon this matter. They have claimed, for example, that in the Old Testament, salvation, gaining the right standing with God, depended not on grace or free offer of God, but rather on works and performance. Mm. They say that as you look at Abraham, as you look at David, as you look at Moses, as you look at these patriarchs in the Old Testament, they contend that you find that they were saved not by faith alone, in Christ alone, but that they were saved by works, by performance, by rigorous and external literal obedience. That's a dichotomy that is contrasted with the New Testament dispensation. And in the New Testament dispensation, it is claimed that now salvation is no longer by works, but it is free offer by grace in Christ alone, apart from works. So you have a dichotomy created within the New Testament church, within Christendom today in large part, between salvation in the Old Testament and salvation in the New Testament. One by works, Old Testament. One by grace, New Testament. Now, I want to submit here, ladies and gentlemen, that both in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, equally on the same footing, in the same matrix, that's a big thing to say, Salvation was always by grace through faith and that faith in Christ alone. And because justific sorry, uh, salvation was by faith in Christ through grace alone in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, the point I'm making here tonight is that 
that which connects the Old Testament and the New Testament as far as redemption is concerned is the doctrine of justification. And so I was just about to take you then to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. There we read the following words, that Abraham, our father in the faith, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God and his faith in God was counted for righteousness. You say, Pastor, that is all good. We can understand that. But how do you find Christ? How did Adam, sorry, Abraham express faith in Christ? That's an easy answer. God promises him a son in chapter 12 of Genesis. And Abraham believes that God will give him a son. The same is reenacted in chapter 15 in that cutting of the covenant that God makes with Abraham. And the same is repeated again in chapter 17. And there is a very dramatic demonstration that is done in chapter 22 of Genesis when God commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and before the old man would drive a dagger into the heart of the young lad, God tells him, don't do it. Look into the thicket for I have provided for myself a lamb. But the lesson in Abraham has been taken in that God will save through the lamb through a son, Isaac, but we know that by the spirit of prophecy, by the spirit of the future, by the spirit of foresight, Abraham is able to know that though I have been promised Isaac, there is one greater than Isaac, there is a spiritual Isaac, so I must look forward. How do I know that? John's Gospel, John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 56 to 58. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 56 to 58. And the Jews are arguing with Jesus in this text. And Jesus tells them, look, before Abraham, your father was, I am. And they protest and they want to stone him. And they say, do you think you're older than our father Abraham? And Jesus tells them, listen, listen carefully. Your father Abraham saw my day isn't that an astounding statement from the Lord in John chapter 8? Your father Abraham, thousands, hundreds of years ago, saw my day and was glad and rejoiced. How did Abraham see the day of Christ? When the promise of Isaac was given to him, he understood it to mean there is a physical Isaac, but there is a spiritual Isaac. The Savior will know the physical Isaac will not be. It will be the spiritual Isaac. And this helps us to understand why, in fact, Abraham could very easily accept to sacrifice this physical Isaac. So, it is true, it was by faith, Genesis 15, 6. It was faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. John chapter 8, verse 56 to 58. So you find then that in the Old Testament, the record is justification is the way that we are saved. It is the way that we are made right with God by faith alone, in Christ alone. But not only that, Psalm 32, another great patriarch of the Old Testament is David. And David also witnesseth of this matter. He speaks of this matter of justification. And he says, even he was saved through faith alone. Here it is in Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Transgressions are there, but they are forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord does not count against them. And whose spirit, whose spirit, there is no deceit. But you see, the same thing is in Romans chapter 4, isn't it? In Romans chapter 4. Our David speaks of the blessedness of the one on whom the sins are not imputed. 
any longer. So I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that the record of the Old Testament is replete with this very idea that salvation is by grace, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. And that is what we are calling justification. So it is a pivotal, central biblical doctrine. But I go on to say something else in this regard. Martin Luther, the German reformer, or in whose, uh, who, who, whom I have referred to many times in your hearing, said the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of justification is the article, listen to this, the doctrine of justification, says Martin Luther, is the article of the standing or falling of the Christian church. Justification is the article of the standing or falling of the Christian church. In other words, Luther is saying, upon this matter, the Christian church stands. Upon this matter, the Christian church falls. John Calvin, John Calvin declares this of this doctrine. He says, it is the hinge, the hinge, upon which the door of salvation turns, either closes or opens upon this doctrine. Justification by faith. Somebody else said, it is the very heart of the gospel. It is the very heart of the gospel. Looking at a human being, that which is a heart to us, Justification by faith is at the heart of the gospel. Another one said it is the active ingredient in the gospel pill. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone is the active ingredient in the gospel pill. If we are to look at the gospel as a tablet, like this piece of proof in here, I wonder, if you can see that in your camera. That particular tablet is big, but the active ingredient that causes pain to go is probably only 5%, perhaps only 2%, but it is the one that makes the difference in our bodies. Now, the gospel message can contain a lot of arguments. It can contain a lot of information, but that information that causes a difference is this doctrine of justification by faith. It is the active ingredient in the gospel pill. Ladies and gentlemen, I raise you even higher. During the great Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, this is what was referred to as the material cause of the Reformation. This was the material cause of the Reformation. The question was how are men, sinful men, made right with God? How can a sinner be justified in the presence of God? Because the Roman Catholic Church raised up many, many, many propositions all through the sacraments, all through the priests, all through the priestcraft, all through penance, all through this other thing. And the reformers were adamant. It is through faith in Christ alone that a man is justified. So it can be said without exaggeration that it is this doctrine, really leading doctrine among a few others, that distinguish us in a marked way from Roman Catholicism. It is this doctrine of justification by faith alone. So, Ladies and gentlemen, how central is this doctrine? How important is this doctrine? It is absolutely important. So even tomorrow, as we begin to examine, for example, uh, the questions of the dilemma of justification, the matrix of justification, and, and the result of justification, and these great issues 
that come out of justification by faith alone as a doctrine. Let us be persuaded that it is absolutely essential. Now here are a few implications of what I've said and then I close. If you do not understand, fully grasp, appreciate, at least in its rudimentary principles, the doctrine of justification, brothers and sisters, we have cause to doubt your profession of faith. We have cause to doubt your profession of of faith for upon what are you basing your faith you remember the tax collector and the pharisee the story we said the last time the pharisee based his justification or is suing for justification based on his works he wasn't depending on christ alone in grace alone through faith alone as the instrumental cause the instrumental hand that reaches out to apprehend these blessings that flow from God. He missed it. What are you depending on? What are you depending on? But you see, again, it is not just about our salvation. What we depend on. But as preachers of the gospel, what prominence have we given the doctrine of justification by faith? Is it a doctrine we preach often in our churches? I dare you, ladies and gentlemen, that if you do not preach justification by faith, you are not preaching the gospel at all. Not at all. If you're not preaching justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, you're not preaching the gospel at all. You may be urging moral duty on people. You may be urging them towards character reformation. But until men have faith in Christ, C.S. Spurgeon said, all their good deeds are but glorious sins. Until men put their faith truly in Christ, all the deeds, good deeds, righteous deeds of men are nothing but glorious sins. For that which is not of faith is sin. So do we preach justification by faith alone in Christ alone? Do we preach that? And all the things that I think have become the, the driving force of my life, really, this one thing in my ministry, in my commission, which I pay very careful attention to, is this matter of making known the gospel of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. This is essential, this is important, this is it. So from tomorrow, I want to dig in with this. I want to go into the nitty-gritty for in the first message, the doctrine of justification, and now the second message in this uh, point, which is really the centrality of the doctrine, I've been kind of easing us into the deep waters. But from tomorrow then, we're going to deal with this thing in a more substantial way. And